I'm going to tell you the truth. There's some people in this room right now, you're watching, and you have been prepared for this moment. And, pre and preparation doesn't always reveal itself or show itself as preparation. Oftentimes it looks like problems. I see two groups. I see one group that have been prepared by problems. You've been, as a result of, of tension and, and tight spots, you have been prepared and, and forced into this very, very right now righteous position. And I see another group. And you've been tested and you've been tried and you've been tested with success. And you didn't allow the success to change you. Yeah, yeah. And, and you got even more hungry with your success. The more successful you became, the hungrier you got. And we're both meeting at the same place. See, it doesn't matter how you get there. Some of us got drugged there. Other, other of us pressed our way to get there, but it doesn't matter. And I feel like we're in a very, very special place. And, and, and when we were worshiping, I just kept hearing the words, that's the difference. And your worship and this moment, this posture that you're in, no matter how you got there, through pain, through difficulty, through testing, through trials, or just through pressing. Some of you have been desperate for God for so long, and you've been pressing in to God, you've been just, despite of what's going on around you, you've been faithful. Things have been trying to pull you in one direction, but you've been faithful. And I feel like it's, it, there's almost like, there's like a veil, it's like gonna be a revealing of you. You, you, you follow, like, 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 a, like a fine piece of art that has been covered because if it was on display, the world around it wouldn't be worthy of witnessing its beauty. And it's almost like God has kept you behind a veil. And I feel like God is slowly getting ready to reveal to everybody else around you who you are and what you have meant to him for the whole time. There's an unveiling getting ready to take place. An unveiling. This is the difference. This is the difference. Because you have chosen being over having. There's something, a very unique anointing on this service. Nine was incredible. We had amazing service. But there's something very, I feel it. I feel a prepared people. And you know what? There's some people in there right now, and you're like, I feel I, prepared. I, I, perplexed, maybe, but not prepared. And I'm telling you, you have stumbled into a moment, and I believe you've stumbled into a moment that you have been waiting for. It is here right now. God is getting ready to reveal you. He's getting ready to pull you out of the darkness and into his marvelous life. And I'm trying to be a good steward of, over this moment right now. Unveiled. I preached a message called What the Cocoon Doesn't Tell You. And if you think about being in the cocoon, you can't see what's outside. And you're not what you used to be. And it's dark. And there's nothing visibly that tells you where you're going. But there is a promise on the inside of you that has sustained you. And I feel like literally you're getting ready to come out of that cocoon. You come out, it's cracking right now. It's breaking right now. It's dissolving right now. And where you once felt that you were in tight quarters, barely could move, in tight quarters, God is getting ready to enlarge your territory. He's getting ready to set your feet on a large ground and you're gonna be able to move again freely. There's a liberty coming to you. All because you're making it your business to be. You've been delivered from the doing mindset and the having mindset. And God has gotten through to you. He's gotten through to you. I promise you, 
You can have without being. And that is depressing. Let me tell you why it's depressing. To have what not being is, is depressing because if you've made your life about getting, once you get, you have nowhere to go. Once you get and you are not fulfilled because fulfillment never comes from outside. Never. It is an illusion. It is a momentary fix. But true fulfillment and wholeness and peace has to do with what goes on on the inside. And so sometimes we have to be delivered from the mindset of doing and getting. It's like something just breaks off of you. And then you realize how much you were driven by the pursuit of things. How much it was actually slavery. I gotta have this, I gotta have that. I have to have them say this about me. And it was bondage. And it was slavery. And so many people were in it, are in it. And so God has literally delivered you. And he's shown you the value of being. And now you are more excited about being. You're more excited about who you are becoming. You're more excited about winning on the inside. And I hear the Lord saying, and all other things will be added unto you. The other way around it will be in all other things will make you you. The perverse ideology of getting over being says, and all other things will make you you. Which means that you're not you until you get. And then you get and you realize that you were more valuable than what you got. It, it starts to fade on you and it starts to leave you and things become disloyal to you. That new car becomes disloyal to you when the new model comes out. You tricked me, you tricked me. Huh. I'm reminded of the disciples as they were doing ministry. There's a guy lame, completely crippled, and he's begging, right? And he's begging, watch this, he's crippled, he's lame, and he's begging for money. He didn't even know what he needed. So the disciples walk by him, and they're asking the disciples for money, and they say, silver and, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have we give unto you. In the name of Jesus, boom, get up and walk. He was after what he thought he needed, not realizing that, that somebody carried something within themselves that gave him what he had never had before. Silver and gold have I none. I want to raise up some people. And there's nothing wrong with having silver and gold, and, and God will give you all that, but, but, I, but I, 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 I want to raise up some people who will say, you know what, silver and gold I may have or I may not have. But such as I have, I'm going to give unto you. I want to raise up some people who understand their substance and their worth and their inner value and worth and live in the conscious of knowing that they are something regardless of whether or not they have something by other people's standard. That's my dream for you. It's my dream for you to see how rich you are, that the grind will shift from deals 
and wheels. That there will be a shift in your grind. And what you will go after more than anything else that you go after in life is you. That you will go after the you that you've been called to be. That you will go after the glorious version of you. The you that is healthy, the you that thinks right, the you that speaks right, the you that has the right heart and the right attitude, the you that's not lazy, the you that won't procrastinate, the you that cannot be shaken with offense. I want to change your hustle. I want to change your hustle. And I want you to start going after something that's greater than anything you could ever amass in life. I see you. I see you. I see you. This whole ministry was built on me seeing you. God showing me you. And I'm talking to that you that's higher than things. I promise you, the, sad, the saddest and the loneliest place to be, I, I swear to you, and I'll tell you the truth, I've been there, is to have everything that you want and still be sad. It's worse. It's worse. Because then... The question arises, well, what else is there? Got it all, and I'm still not happy. I want to change your hustle. This whole series called B is about changing, and it's it's totally counterculture but it's about changing your grind. And I want you to be like Paul in Philippians 3. And he talks about all of his earthly accomplishments. And then he says, but I count all these things as rubbish, as nothing, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his sufferings. And then he says, I have not attained, I'm already perfected, but this thing I do, I forget those things that are behind me and I reach forward to those things that are ahead of me and I press toward the mark for the upward call of God. He was not talking about pressing towards things. He was talking about, I am trying to lay hold of what Christ has laid hold on me for. You have to understand why God touched you. He he did not touch you to give you things. He touched you to make you something beyond anything that you can ever imagine yourself as being. He created you in his image. So his goal for you and I is to become more like him. Not simply so that you can reflect him. That's true, but let me just, let's be selfish just for a moment. Not simply so that you can reflect him. That's part of it, but that's not all of it. It's because it's who he created you to be. God is after the version of you that he envisioned before he put you in your mother's womb. He's after that. Because all he can see, Jay-Z, when he sees you, is that. And so anything that lacks that, he's trying to shape. He's the potter, you know, so the word calls him the potter and we are the clay, right? But he's not randomly shaping you. He is shaping you according to what he foreknew about you which is what motivated him to create you. 
So he's got an image in his mind about how you think, how you speak, how you love, how you forgive, how you function, how you operate, how you move. And so what happens is when he sees us not functioning in that, he realizes that there are counterfeit parts on the creation that he made. God wants to change your hustle. And if we would have the faith to say, God, I know culture says that I got to be a billionaire by the time I'm 50. Hello, somebody. I, I know culture says that I need to have accomplished all these things by now. I'm going to trust you that the best use of my time is first to become. See, that's faith. Because first of all, we don't even know what that looks like. Not fully. So I'm going to suspend my hustle to become, and God says, that's what I want. That's what I want. And so what does he do? He sends us an image named Jesus. He doesn't say, I, you know, I just want you to be this random being. He sends Jesus to become a mirror to us and to project back to us what fullness should look like. He's saying, well, am I supposed to be like Jesus? Do I grow my hair? <laughs> no. Watch this. Understand this. Maybe you grow your hair. I wish I could. Okay. It's not looking like Jesus. It's looking like you in him. I need to say that better. I need, I need. Because there, there is a, a distinct way that you look like a son of God or a daughter of God. And it factors in your uniqueness. So in other words, me in the character of Jesus and you in the character of Jesus will have similarities there are certain things that we will emit as it relates to character and heart, but we will be completely different. Does that make sense? And so it was said of the disciples after Jesus ascended to heaven and they were still out doing their thing. It was said that it was obvious that they had been with Jesus, but they were completely different. They had different idiosyncrasies and different little ways and different little quirks and things about them, but the essence, the most important things were consistent. So I'm not trying to make you what you're not. I'm trying to encourage you to pursue what you are. You follow what I'm saying? And to be it, Jesus, family, you talk about success, Jesus was wildly successful. He was wildly successful emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and financially. Like, wait, hold on. Jesus was, yes, he was. He had everything. It was great. He had everything, he owned everything. There was a time, there was a time in the scripture where he's with his disciples and, and, and he's like, you know, he needed to fulfill the prophecy which says that, you know, he's going to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, right? And so his, he told his disciples, hey, go down there and get, get, get me an ass, give me a donkey, right? And they're looking at him like, you didn't give us no money. He's like, just tell him the Lord has need of it. <laughs> and you know... Are you going down to Costco? <laughs> you know what I mean? And you get up to the register, and they're like, PT say, you know, he has need of it. 
But they went down there and lo and behold, they spoke. And the ass was theirs. He lacked nothing. Matter of fact, I can remember a time in the scripture where Peter didn't have enough money to pay his taxes. Hello, somebody. He was struggling. The struggle was real for Peter. Okay. Somebody said, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So he goes to Jesus and he's like, Jesus, you know, should you we pay taxes and blah, blah, blah. And Jesus is like, yeah, of course you should. And he tells him literally where to go to get it. He's like, row your boat out here and drop your, your, your fishing rod, drop your net over here on the right side of the boat and pull it up. And when you pull it up, you're going to find a fish. And in the fish, in the mouth of a fish will be a coin. I love that. He wasn't broke. But see, you have to understand that there's a difference between not having it in your pocket and not having it. There's a difference between not having it in your bank account and not having it. As long as you are connected to the one who owns it all, you are rich. Oh, you are rich. You have no idea how rich you are. And as you tap into him and you become, because some of us, watch this, some of us, not you, but somebody you might know, they want from Jesus, but they don't want Jesus. Oh, cut about a million, please. Oh, shut about a million. Bye bye. You have a new tongue. Bye 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 You're already rich in him. I swear you are. I would rather have the promise that God will supply all of my need than a billion dollars in my account. For a plethora of reasons. Plethora of reasons. I, I don't know who I would be with immediate access to the billion without Jesus. But don't look at me like that. Don't, don't, don't. don't. You get $100,000 and you're like, what? See, the, <laughs> the promise that God will supply all of my needs is greater than a billion dollars. Because what if I find myself in a situation where my need is two? If my need is two and I have the promise, I've got the two. I want, I want some people to trust God enough. I'm not saying don't be diligent, right? Of course not. Work. Do your thing. The scripture says you don't work, you don't eat. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying... Break the unhealthy attitude about the hustle and reorder and reprioritize the hustle and take care of your greatest asset first, which is you. It's you. You are your greatest asset. You haven't even explored the depths of the magnificence of you. You, you haven't even seen all that there is to you. Oh my God. You, you haven't even discovered there are parts of you that are very royal and profound that will blow you away. You want to hang out with you more when you find that, that part of you. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I'm looking for treasure outside of myself when God has put the greatest treasure in me. And until I can find my own treasure, I cannot even project my worth in a way that will attract my wealth. I can't even sell myself right. I can't get what I'm worth because, because I can't sell myself right and I can't sell myself right because I don't see myself right. And I don't see myself right because I haven't spent time mining out the treasure that's already there. I'm trying to get people to respond to a lesser version of myself. That's why God keeps you veiled. He keeps you veiled until you have discovered the value of you. Because until you know the value of you, you will present and project less. And as a result of it, attract less. And the sad part about it is you'll be comfortable with the offer that came in. Being. Being. It's time to be. I'm trying to manage this moment right. I'm completely off script and out of time and all that kind of stuff. But B, Jesus came. The greatest thing that Jesus offered was not the miracles. It was himself. It was himself. We miss the essence for the hand. The greatest thing that he did was to show you a picture of who you were destined to be. And then he says, take, eat. This is my body. Consume me. Don't just take my hand. Don't just want me to bless you or help you to find a mate or give you some money or don't, don't you, you miss me. Eat me. Consume me. Become me. See, he, he's not jealous or selfish or I need to be. No, 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 no. That wasn't God's plan. Romans 8:29 says that who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that his son will become the firstborn of many brethren. God, we, we know Jesus as the only begotten son, and that's wonderful, but do we know him as the firstborn son? In other words, God is looking for many sons and daughters. Yes, do we know him? We know him as Savior, and he is. But do we know him as the one who wants us to become so that we can save ourselves from living in a lesser version of who God has created us to be? Could he be desiring to save us from a less than? version of us. If any man is in Christ, he's a new, what? 
creation. All things. All things. What old things are we living in right now? Thinking that they're new things, but they're old things. Old ways of thinking, old ways of feeling, old ways of being, old ways of operating. For some people, the issue is not even what you do, it's the way you do it. For some people, it's not even your action it is your way. Your way has to do with how you go about things. How you arrive at things. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. For, for some of you, God, God wants to heal your ways. And one of the reasons why you always end up at a certain destination is because your ways don't change. No matter what city you're in, no matter what state you're in, no matter what age you are, you always arrive at a certain place. Could it be that I'm changing geography but not changing me? Could it be that I'm changing relationships, but not changing me. Could it be me? Because guess what? I am the only common denominator of all of those experiences. And so God says that this series is called Be. Doing is not going to get it for you. Getting is not going to get it for you. Being is going to get it all for you. Hmm. And so we've been talking about the anatomy of God. And we looked at how Ephesians 4 and 11 talks about he gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. We've looked at those things as offices, just stay with me because I'm going to do this for about 10 minutes, land the plane, and we'll be done. So you just stay with me. That was so beautiful what you're doing behind me. He's killing it. Aren't they awesome? Can we give it up for our worship leadership team? Amazing. 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 He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. We looked at that, and we also saw that each of those offices, if you were last week, each of those offices represent functions that represent the anatomy of God. We're called to be the body of Christ, and I believe the body of Christ not only means that, you know, you're, we're all together as believers. I, I think the deeper meaning of being the body of Christ is that we're actually supposed to embrace and receive aspects of Christ's anatomy and live out those aspects on earth. Benefits are, A, who would we be if we were like him? Like, really like him, right? If we became the body of Christ, if we became in our own space like Jesus, first of all, not only will that bless everybody around us, but we get to become like Christ. I don't think that it should be sold as you have to be like Christ. I believe that it should be presented as you get to be like Christ. We, we have the privilege and the honor of being like Christ. He was amazing and wildly successful. Wildly successful. Wildly successful. Anybody believe that Jesus was successful? Guess what? The entity that he started is still alive today. Come on, somebody. You talk about an entrepreneur. It didn't die with him. The most successful entity in the world right now is the church that he started. He told Peter, on you, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. He set up something that could not fail. 
If I were to poll people, not in this room, because you would answer properly now, but if I were to walk down the street and I poll people, you know, who do you admire and who would you love to be, be like? Oh, it would be, you know, Steve Jobs and, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and, and all these other people or whatever. <laughs> That's great. Because we see the success, but we don't know about the failures behind the scenes. Matter of fact, well, Steve Jobs' movie kind of. Because our mind is get or do and not be. We poll people and they be, oh, I want to be like this person. I want to be this person. If I can have it, I want that. Give me this Einstein, whoever it is. You ask me, I want to be like Jesus. Because he had the inside thing and he had the outside thing. He was wildly successful in every way. God's eyes and the eyes of man. It says that Jesus in Luke 2, 52, it says that Jesus, the child Jesus, he grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and with man. I want that anointing. I want to grow in wisdom. I want to grow in stature, Right? Wisdom, that's inside. Stature is outsides. I want to grow in wisdom, inside. Stature, outsides. And as that happens, I'll grow in favor with God and with man. That's what your insides being developed does. But anyway, so we talked about the prophets, the apostles, and all we talked about those things, and we saw how they represented Christ's anatomy, and we talked about you know, the, the, the teacher representing the mind of God, right? He instructs. The, the pastor's representing the heart of God and the hands of God, right? Shepherd's heart, you know, shepherd's heart. David was a shepherd. He had a great heart. Hands of God touching, leading, and blessing. We talked about evangelists, and they, they are preachers of the word of God. And so we talked about the mouth of God, right? All these things in the anatomy of God that make up the body of Christ, all of which we have access to as well. And so, so I know that oftentimes we might look at that and say, I'm not an apostle, and so I'm not the feet of God. I'm not a prophet, so I'm not the eyes of God. I'm not, you know, an evangelist, so I'm not the mouth of God. I'm not, I'm not you know, a, a pastor, so I'm not the heart and the hands. I'm not a teacher, so I'm, I'm not the, the mind of God. But guess what? One of the things that I realize is that all of us can have a little bit of that in us. And I truly believe that becoming is becoming the anatomy of God and all these attributes and what these attributes represent. And so last week I kind of touched on, I don't think I got to it this service at the 9 o'clock, I touched on the mind of God because I wanted to preach about the mind of God because the mind of God is sexy, it's wonderful, it's awesome. The mind of God to know things, right? To be brilliant, to be creative. I want the mind of God. I thought about that. I was excited, but I jumped the gun. Because I believe that, that it, it is, you know, that is the sexy part of God, his mind. I can think like God. I'm thinking the highest thought and all that's wonderful and it's grand and we'll get to it. But, 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 as I really begin to meditate more deeply on this series, I realize that there was a part of God's anatomy that is more important than the mind of God because of sequence. Because I believe that, that God only fully unlocks and releases and gives access to his mind to people who first have his heart. And I just want to, I, I have no time for it now. But I just want to tell you, I want to give you seven characteristics of God's heart. And it's not for you to emulate, it's for you to understand what you have access to as children of God. And I'm going to give you those seven attributes, and then I'm going to pray for you because I believe this. I believe that God, I believe that Christ was a mirror. And the more that we have Christ in us, we have to understand that we have these attributes in us already. It's just a matter of yielding to his spirit. The beautiful thing about the spirit of God, the beautiful thing about the spirit of Christ is the spirit of Christ is the you that you want to be but can't be in your own strength. Say that again. The beautiful thing about the spirit of Christ is that in the spirit of Christ exists the you that you want to be but cannot be in your own strength. Feel something on that right there. Raise your hand if you want to be more than you feel like you are. Okay, that's wonderful. I got news for you. The Spirit of God in you already is. Already is. In other words, there is more in you already. And this whole series 
is about coming to a place where we pursue being. We, when we pursue being, then we start pursuing spiritual things. We start pursuing God. And so these things that I'm going to show you, these seven attributes, are not things that I'm trying to get you to be in your own strength. I'm trying to get you to just be or let these things happen. There's a passage that says, let this mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you. Let it. Allow it. Christ wants to think through your brain. He wants to exist in your heart. Oh, God, I feel it. He wants to love through you. He wants to touch through you. He, he's waiting to release the highest version of you by his spirit in you, and it is possible. I'm going to give you seven attributes of Christ's heart. These are the things that are in you. We're going to pray these things, impart these things. We're going to stir these things up. And then I'm going to say, in Jesus' name, amen, go get me a little bite to eat and come back here and do my one o'clock service. <laughs> All right. Seven attributes. We're going to run through these really quickly. The first one is about purity. In Matthew 5 and 8, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's another passage of scripture talks about how the eyes of the Lord go to and fro. This is in 2 Chronicles 16 and 9, or 9 and 16. I think it's 16 and 9. But it says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are loyal. He's speaking of an undivided heart, a pure heart. And let me tell you something right now. When I think about how I position myself to gain so much from God, so much insight, so much understanding, so much favor, so much grace, it always comes back to one thing, and it's my heart. I'll be honest with you. You know, you look at David, and, you know, David, you know, had a, a very colorful background. Just study his life. I mean, I mean, woof, you know. But his heart was good. I remember in, in 1 Samuel, they're talking about David, and, and, and they had overlooked David because they were looking for someone who reflected the outer aspects of a king. And they literally looked over David. And God says, you're not looking at the right thing. Man looks at the outer aspects. I look at the heart. Amen. There's another passage that says you got to keep your heart. Proverbs 24 and 3. Keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it spring the issues of life. Never underestimate the value of a pure heart. My wife and I are interviewing people, and we're dealing with people, and we're, you know, considering who to get into business with. You know, yeah, obviously we consider, you know, your competence and all those sort of things, but more than anything we look at, we're praying for God to show us your heart. Because you can't, listen, I, I can work with some competence things a little bit, maybe, perhaps. But I can't work with a heart. Because that's between you and God. I can't change your heart. I can't fix your heart. And out of your heart spring everything about your life. And so we're looking for pure heart. And a pure heart has to be maintained. And there will always be things that go after your heart. Oh, I feel God. Offense goes after your heart. Get angry and bitter. All those things go after your heart. Jealousy is a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Right? Sometimes our heart gets dirty. We treasure things in our heart that we shouldn't. And the tricky thing about the heart is that nobody knows it but you and God. And so you can literally have things in your heart sitting here, not any of you, but you can be sitting in churches and have things in your heart. And because no one knows it and because your lips can say one thing, we don't deal with it. I, I, I'm trying to move on, but I feel this right here. We don't, we don't deal with the issues of our heart. And I'm telling you right now, an impure heart will block you. Because it's the thing that God is looking at. And he knows until your heart gets clean. He can't do what he wants to do. Pure heart. That's something you got to pray for every day. I love Fred Hammond. He had a song, Create Within Me a Pure Heart. Remember that? A clean heart. Remember that? Give me a clean heart. Ain't what I do. I don't know the words, but you, you remember that song? 
Like, go oh, find it's, it's a dope song. It's like one of the first songs that I learned when I started walking with God because I realized that my issues were not outer issues. My outer issues were connected to things that were in my heart. Jesus had a beautiful heart. It was a pure heart. And as a result of it, he can love purely. And there might be some people in there right now. Let me tell you something. God is concerned about what's in your heart. You need room. I teach my daughters all the time. My daughters, well, my baby girl's here today. But I, I teach my daughters all the time. I'm like, you know, Dad, you know, I, they've got, I've been teaching them since they were little to guard their hearts. And one of the reasons why is that when you give your heart to something, whatever it is, has got you. You follow me? And when it's time for you to move, because wisdom tells you now that, that you've got to move from that thing, you can't move because you try to go this way, but that thing has got your heart. And now you got to fight and wrestle your heart back and kill a part of you in order to be free to walk into destiny. That's why you can't give your heart cheap because watch this, when it's time to move and you've given your heart to something, you have to cut your own heart. And the process of it growing again is long and it's painful and there are withdrawals. Don't play with your heart. Don't play with your heart. Enemies after your heart. You talk about him being after your mind, yeah, but he's after your heart. Because if he can get your heart, he can get your mind. You gotta guard it. You gotta protect it. God, each day, Lord, give me a pure heart. Lord, I, I thought about something, man. Something, something passed by me and, and I caught it. And I can't get that image out of my mind. Create within me a pure heart. Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to something I shouldn't be. Can I just keep it 100 in this room right now? God, I'm, I, I saw something and I'm, I'm attracted to it, but I know it's not for me. I know it's not right for me and it's in my heart and I can't pretend because I feel it in my heart. That's how real you got to be with God. And you got to take that heart every single day and you got to hold it up to Jesus and say, God, this heart belongs to you. I, I need you. I'm going to delight myself in you and I want you to put the right desires in my heart. You got to be desperate for a pure heart. Number two, and I have 50, but number two is Christ had a compassionate heart. All these things are in you. You have an anointing, a grace for a pure heart. Man, I feel that for some of you. It says, blessed are those who are pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In other words, there's a connection between the purity of your heart and your ability to perceive what God is doing. There's a connection between the purity of your heart and what you have the ability to see. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Man, I feel this. There are incredible things, good things, that oftentimes we cannot see because of impurities in our heart. Can't even see them. And if I can't see them, I can't move toward them. If I can't move toward them, I can't lay hold of them. If I can't lay hold of them, then destiny is delayed all because of my heart. And now maybe it makes sense when it says, keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it spring the issues of life. In addition to having a pure heart, you've got to have a compassionate heart. All these things are in you. Jesus was compassionate. Right. There's some people. I had a friend and she would say, I just don't like people. <laughs> she was honest. I mean, she, you know, and I'm just like, I don't understand. <laughs> you love Jesus, but you don't like people. I'm struggling <laughs> with that because Jesus was all about people. You know what I mean? And what she didn't realize was that there was love inside of her. But obviously there was something in her heart that was blocking the release of the flow of God's compassion towards humanity. Heart like Christ is a compassion. Now, there's nothing wrong with being compassionate. I saw this, this video the other day, and uh, I guess some guy, little 16-year-old kid, is ashamed, had brass knuckles on. And, uh, and they, this video, it went viral, but whatever, but he took brass knuckles, he's a 16-year-old kid, and he blindsides this 12-year-old kid with the brass knuckles and like just beat the poor guy on there. And I'm like, oh man, that's terrible. I'm the type of dude, you know, the MMA, and I know, look, I'm not mad at anybody. But I look at that, and I'm like, oh, because I feel for people. 
I love people with every blow, you know. I, I, just, I, I just do. And again, I'm not knocking it because sport is sport and whatever you sign up for, you sign up for, whatever. It ain't my deal. But there's nothing wrong with being compassionate. Caring about people. Loving on people. It changes everything. I believe that the world, literally God created the world equal. And balanced. And the reason why you have a lot of have-nots, one of the reasons why you have a lot of have-nots is because those who have, some of them aren't compassionate. I'm not saying give your fortune away, but I'm saying we ought to be moved with compassion because literally these tennis shoes can change somebody's week. What we would spend on tennis shoes could literally change some family's week. Compassion. Number three, faith film. Talking about these things. These things are in your heart. A faith-filled heart. There's some people in there right now, you wouldn't consider your heart faith-filled. But you have access to a faith-filled heart, a heart that believes that anything can happen and that all things are possible. Number four, Braveheart. My favorite movie is called Braveheart. Hey. You remember that? Sons of Scotland. No, nobody? I, it was a great movie. I, I, one of my favorite movies of all times. But in Christ, your heart is brave. Your heart is bold in Christ. It's strong in Christ. I want to just run through these. Number five, how about a loyal heart? Jesus had all these things. And if you're a believer, you have access to all these things, a loyal heart, a heart that's loyal to God, a heart that's loyal to others. And watch this. How about a heart that's loyal to you? The definition of false loyalty is putting your loyalty to others above the loyalty of yourself. No, I see so many people, and they are loyal to others to the detriment of themselves. That's not the Lord. you got to love you first, right? Love you first, and then love others the way you love you. Be loyal to yourself first, and then be loyal to others the same way you're loyal to yourself. How about loyal heart? The sixth type of heart that Christ had was a non-judgmental heart. He saw everything. And he didn't even talk about it. Matter of fact, the only thing you see people, talk, Jesus talking about were judgmental people. He was so non-judgmental that all he dealt with was judgmental people. They like grieved him. Because at the heart of judgmentalism is hypocrisy. And I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it. The heart of judgmentalism is hypocrisy because no one ever judges someone who has the same struggle as them. They always judge according to an issue that they cannot connect with. Hypocrisy. Blah. And lastly, Christ had a tenacious heart. I believe right now that you have access to a heart that will not quit, that will not fail, that cannot be discouraged, and that won't give up. And I want to pray for you because it's time to go. Come on, stand. If you don't have to leave, don't leave. We just want to pray for you real quick. Obviously, we're, we're moving on next week, and we got it's going to be fun. But I believe you're becoming something. And I believe it's happening right now. You're becoming something. There's a treasure in you, and I can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see you shine. Guard your heart. Guard it. Fight for it. You see anything in your heart that doesn't belong there? Don't be okay with it being there. What you tolerate, you affirm. Whatever you tolerate in your heart, you affirm that it's worthy enough to be there. Fight for it. There's some things that I had in my heart I had to be real. I remember once I was struggling with something, we got to go. But I remember once I was struggling with something and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't break out of it. And you know why I couldn't break out of it? Because the issue had settled into my heart. It had roots in me. It was beyond addiction. It had roots in the core of who I am. And once I realized and once I was honest with myself and said, you know what? I'm fighting this, but I actually like it. In my heart. Once I got there, my prayer about it changed. Because now I realize that the only way I can get free from this is if I give my heart 
to God. Sometimes you can't just give that thing to God. You have to give your whole heart to God. Give it to him. Say, God, my heart is yours. It belongs to you. You take out the desire that you want and put the desire in it and then give me my heart back. And I won't take my heart back until you're finished with it. (laughs) Delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. That does not mean that whatever is in your heart, the moment that you are delighting yourself in the Lord, he's going to give to you. Because you can have some freaky things in your heart (laughs) at the present moment. That is not what that passage means. You delight yourself in the Lord, so you basically take your heart, you take your hands off of your heart, and in worship, you give him your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. God, I just, I love you. I just want you, God, here. I'm loving you with all of my heart, and I have no loyalty to my heart in this moment. Because the truth of the matter is, I can't trust it. Because it wants what it wants, and what it wants sometimes is not good for me. So I don't really trust it like that, And the only way that I can follow my heart, you hear people say, follow your heart. Next time somebody tell you to follow your heart, just smack them. (laughs) Don't do that. Oh, child, just follow your heart. Your heart will have you in the trickiest situation of all times. (laughs) Just follow your heart. I mean, come on, seriously. Anybody's heart ever led you into some craziness? You know, it's just you crazy, and now you fight trying to get your heart back. No, 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 no. The only way that you can really trust your heart, I'm not talking about your instincts and your guts. No, I'm, listen, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit moving yet. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your heart. Yours. The only way that you can trust your heart is if you delight yourself in the God so much that you give it to him. And then the promise is he will give you the desires of your heart. He will put the right desires in your heart. He will appropriate your desire. That's what that passage means. And once he does what he wants to do with your heart, you take it back. And now you can trust him because he's only going to make you want what he wants for you. And because your heart becomes pure like this water, you'll be able to see differently. And you'll be able to see what he has for you. And your faith will actually be activated and unlocked. Sometimes the reason why we don't have faith, we can't even receive those high-level words that speak to our destiny is because there are impurities in our heart, and those impurities in our heart bring a sense of unworthiness of God's best. So a dirty heart works against our destiny. I want to pray for you. You hear, you feel like God's been speaking to you all day, and you want to change your hustle. You hear, and you're like, God, I need, man, pastor was talking to me today. He's talking to me today. I've got value untapped, and I've been selling myself short. Maybe you're here and you say, you know what, God, create within me a clean heart. I'm doing a lot of things right, but if I'm honest, i got some things in my heart. Why am I holding this up like it's a mic? I'm being honest. (laughs) If I'm honest, the things in my heart, and I don't want my heart to get in the way of destiny. There's somebody right now, and you might need to be healed from a broken heart. Relationship caught you up. You, you be, you're such a good person that you gave your heart to somebody or something that was undeserving, and you want your heart back. Oh, man, there's nothing like a broken heart. Oh, God, it's the worst. I mean, it's just, it's, woo. It's, it's, ah. What are you going to do with a broken heart? But God can fix it. There are times in my life where I had to say goodbye to some things, and it cost me to say goodbye, right? 
It cost me emotionally. It cost me my heart. I had to literally cut off my heart and go back in the presence of God with this, with this half heart because I didn't go where God told me to go. Anybody ever stayed in something longer than you're supposed to stay? You follow what I'm saying? All the signs were there. I ignored all the signs, and my heart just fell deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And now, had I gone, when, when God had told me to go on, when God told me to leave, had I gone then, then it would have just been just a minute. You know, I would just, you know, it would have been a tough maybe two tears. Hello, somebody. Uh, uh, but I'm good, right? But I stay longer than I should have, and I didn't move when God told me to move, and now I can hardly get out of the bed. If that's you and you're here, I want you to come forward too. God's going to heal it. He's going to heal it. Because what, what's going on is that's a hole in your heart. God's going to give you a new heart. It's not just relationships. It can be anything. We went too far. Went too far. The scripture talks about how we ought not grieve the Holy Spirit. And, and sometimes that's taken wrong. That means that sometimes, you know, the Holy Spirit is grieved because of our action. Well, look at it differently. The Holy Spirit is all-knowing, which means that he knows what's on the other side of our foolishness. And the Holy Spirit, since he's the Spirit of God, is love. And so he's saying, oh, don't do that. Oh, don't, don't, don't do that. Don't, oh, because there's something. Can, I know you're looking at the moment, but I'm looking at the whole picture. And I know what that's going to cost you. Listen to me. So he's grieved when we just kind of just turn him away. I'm excited for you. Because when your heart, I'm telling you, your heart is the key to everything. Keep it with all diligence. Out of it, let's bring the issues of life. Come on, baby. Father, take our heart and filter it through your spirit. And as you're filtering it, Father, strip away anything that's not of you. And help us to not be sad about the things that we must walk away from so that we can be conformed through you. Help us to not pledge our allegiance to things that harm us and hurt us, but make us feel good in the moment instead, Father. Give us the discipline to have a pure heart, that when bitterness and unforgiveness threaten to, to harm us, that I, we would protect our hearts. Father, we're asking that you would show us who we really are. Not who we want to be, not who our plans will make us become, but that you would show us the reflection of us that exists in heaven. And that we would believe that we still have access to that gift. We rebuke right now in the name of Jesus any thought, any spirit, any decision that would make us believe that our best is not ahead of us. For we know that all things are working together for our good. So we don't have to be ashamed anymore. And we don't have to be broken any longer because you were crucified. We have access to your heart. So grant us the gift of being known by you. And better yet, the gift of us knowing you in a deeper way. Father, there are broken hearts at this altar. Hearts that aren't sure that they can ever be restored. And right now, we turn it over to you the master of all pieces, the one who is a perfectionist of making all things work together. Father, heal our hearts. See our brokenness and tell us that it's still okay, that you can make even the most shameful thing work together for our good. Father, right now, we just ask for every son and daughter represented at this altar that they would be overwhelmed by your love that they would feel your presence in their life so strong, not just in this moment, that even when they leave this place, that they would be reminded of your love, that your love is working on them right now, that each morning when we wake up, we would turn our hearts over to you and say, have your way, Father. And as you have your way, that we would be reminded that you would never call us to walk away from something that you didn't plan on replacing with something bigger and better. 
So we will no longer grieve the things that we must leave behind, for we recognize that on the other side of our sacrifice is worship, and on the other side of our worship is victory. And so we're willing to go through the process, and we're willing to endure the cycle, for we recognize that you haven't meant to harm us, but to prosper us and give us a future and a hope. So we thank you, Father, for we praise in advance for that future. That even when things are happening that we don't understand that you're working things out on our behalf. Thank you for being our lawyer in the courtroom. Thank you for going ahead of us and making the crooked path straight. Thank you for trusting us with promise and trusting us with this breath. Thank you for trusting us with your heart and giving us the attributes to become more like you. Father, we ask that you would continue to transform us and mold us. Until all people see when they look at us is not our achievements, not our accolades, but all they see is you shining through our brokenness, that all they see is you shining through our generations of hurt, that all they see is you. Because we had a moment on 614 North La Brea that changed our lives forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. We're going to make a declaration. Hallelujah. I just want you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I hear this word and I receive it. I give you my heart. It's yours. Create within me a clean heart. Put your desire in me and remove anything unworthy of me. I thank you for Jesus. Thank you for making him who had no sin become all of my mistakes, all of my weakness. You placed in his body, nailed it to the cross, and put it to death. And just like he was raised up, this day, I'm raised up, and I'm on my way. My past is behind me, and my future is amazing. Nothing can stop me, because I've got Christ's heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Love you so much.